As you focus on the breath, you want to put aside all the narratives about today, yesterday, last month, next month, that tend to fill up your mind. For the time being, you want to be right here. There's no real narrative about the breath. There's a breath coming in, there's a breath going out. You can comment on it. But once you've commented on your last breath, you want to put that aside and comment now on the current breath coming in until things can really settle down. And then you can even stop the comments and just be with the sensation of the breathing. Come to that state where everything is a oneness. This is where we all want to get in the meditation. And so we tend to get impatient when the mind is not ready to settle down. And sometimes we think we're not supposed to think at all. The only way we can get the mind to settle down is forcing it down. But that's not the case. Sometimes you have to go back and dig up some of those narratives, the ones that are getting in the way. And as you notice, they, they get in the way in two ways. Sometimes they just blatantly come up and the mind actually harries them. The way that dog harries at a bone. Gnawing away, gnawing away, gnawing away. Other times, though, there are narratives that are below the surface. Things you try to shove out of the way, but they won't stay shoved out of the way. They're festering someplace in the mind. And the only way you're going to get the mind to settle down is to dig them up and sort them out. This is why the Buddha didn't simply teach meditation techniques. But you taught ways to look at the narratives of your life. In terms of karma and in terms of rebirth. This is one of those teachings that people in the West tend to have a lot of problems with because we don't know how to handle it. We don't know what its purpose is. We think it's simply just something we're forced to believe the way our original religion forced us to believe things. But the Buddha never forced anything on anybody. He offered his teachings as aids to putting an end to suffering. And he said teaching on rebirth is a very skillful working hypothesis to help you understand what you're doing, why you're doing it. And also to help with the narratives of your life. He said he couldn't prove rebirth, but it is true. He said you'll find that as you progress in the practice, there will reach a point where you actually confirm for yourself that it really is true. This isn't your only lifetime. And if you're not careful, if you keep feeding off of craving, there are going to be more lifetimes. But it's a useful framework for thinking about a lot of other issues in life as well besides the issue of whether you're going to have another rebirth. We tend to think of it as a big selfing kind of thought, which doesn't fit in with that not-selfing that the Buddha teaches. But actually it's useful for both, skillful selfing and skillful not-selfing. And the teaching on not-selfing doesn't wait until the very end, when all you see are things in terms of the five aggregates and you See if they're in constant, stressful, not self, and you let them go. Because actually the perception of not self is the shadow side of any perception of self. When you have a definition of who you are, there's going to be something that you are not. And the two go together. And the question is, where are you going to draw the line? We're drawing these lines all the time. And one of the things that the Buddha wants you to get some skillful training in is how to draw the line skillfully. Says a little child, your sister is down the road, is being beaten up by somebody else. Well, you go down there, she's your sister. She's inside the line of yourself. What belongs to you? So you go down to defend her. 
then when you get back to the house, you start playing together, and she takes your toy truck, and all of a sudden she's not your sister anymore. She's part of the not-self. And we do this all the time. We define our sense of who we are around what we want. We define our sense of what we have, what belongs to us around what we can use to get what we want. And then we define ourselves about the person who's going to be consuming what we want or enjoying what we want when you get it. In cases like that, not-self is basically whatever is irrelevant to that particular desire or whatever is getting in the way of that desire, or the things you find that you can't use in order to attain that desire. So it's a type of perception that we apply all the time. We're, we're selfing and not selfing all the time. And the teaching on rebirth gives us some good practice in learning how to do this skillfully. As on the one hand, the whole idea that you can shape this life and lives into the future gives you a sense of power. It also reminds you that you're responsible. You have to make skillful decisions. And so you look at this life and see what is there that you can hold on to? What will you be able to carry over and what can you not carry over? And you realize there's an awful lot you can't carry over. What you can carry over are the, the good actions you've done in body, speech, and mind. One of the very one of the most simple teachings on that self is that one that Ratabala gives to the king Gauravya. He says the world is swept away. The world has nothing of its own. One has to pass on, leaving everything behind. The king is wealthy. He's enjoying himself with all the sensual pleasures that a king can have. And Ratabala asks him, can you carry those sensual pleasures over with you into the next life? And the king says, no. And that's the basic teaching on not self. There are a lot of things you can't carry over. So what do you focus on? Well, Gamasagomi, I'm the owner of my actions. You try to act in a skillful way. And the Buddha applies this to the teachings on the what are called the loka dhammas, the, the dhammas of the world. There's gain, loss, status, loss of status, praise, criticism, pleasure, and pain. These things come to you in the course of this life, but they're not really yours. And so you want to learn to def define yourself around, well, what can you get out of these things? You, when gain, material gain comes, you can learn how to use it skillfully. You gain skillful karma, you gain skillful mental qualities. So at the time when the material gain goes, you've, you've got what's really of worth there. And John Lee says it's like squeezing the juice out of a fruit. The material object itself, he says, is like the remains of the fruit after you've squeezed the juice out of it, the leftover pulp. But you've gotten the juice. The same with, the same with status, the same with praise. You gain status, you gain power. Okay, can you use that power in a way that actually will leave you with some skillful karma? leave you with some good mental qualities. Most people don't. Once they get some power, they want to use it for whatever. They think it's theirs, and of course then when they lose their status, they get all upset that nobody pays any attention to them anymore. They don't have that power anymore. The problem is they identified with the status when they had it. It was an unskillful way of defining self and an unskillful way of thinking about not-self. When you're praised, remember, why do people praise you? Because they want to encourage you in the good actions you're doing. On the one hand, you have to look. I mean, is this praise really worthwhile? What, what do they want out of you? Why do they encourage you to do that particular action? Do they mean you well or not? You can't just take the praise and identify with saying, yeah, this is me. This is what I am, a wonderful person. 
because sometimes their motives are suspect. And even when their motives are good, you have to remember, it's not just to say, I'm good enough as I am. They're trying to encourage you to keep on being good and get better. So that's a way of taking praise and using it for the purpose of develop some, developing something you really can take with you. As for pleasure and pain, the Buddha has you ask yourself, what pleasures are useful, what pleasures are good for the mind, what pleasures are bad for the mind. And the same with pain. There's that passage in one of the suttas where the Buddha talks about learning how to tolerate pain. But he pairs that with a passage where he says, well, you also know enough not to get yourself into dangerous situations. You see a pit in your path, you walk around the pit. You don't let yourself just fall into it saying that you're going to be patient and endure everything. You have common sense not to take on un any unnecessary pains. I mean, there's plenty enough pain in the body as it is, plenty enough pain in this world as it is. You don't go out looking for it. Unless you find that you're indulging yourself in a comfortable place and your mind is deteriorating, okay, then you have to go out and find a place that may not be quite so comfortable. In other words, you learn how to use pleasure and use pain for the good of the mind. So on the one hand, you're developing a good sense of responsibility, a healthy sense that you do have the power to shape your happiness. But you also have to be heedful. You can't just indulge in whatever comes your way that you like, because sometimes it has its hidden poisons. And if you simply indulge, you're developing a lot of unskillful qualities in the mind, a lot of weaknesses in the mind, a mind that depends on things being a certain way in order for it to be happy. And the same pattern of thinking applies to other areas of life as well. You think about your relatives. They're your relatives now. They won't be forever. As the Buddha once said, it's hard to find someone who has not been your mother, someone who has not been your father, who has not been your brother, who has not been your sister, who has not been your daughter or son. Rebirth has been going on in that long. But while you have this relationship, you want to make the best use of it. Be kind to the person, be good to the person in whatever way you find skillful. But realizing that the relationship will have to end at some point. And as the Buddha said, this person who came into your life or you came into their life, you don't know where you were before or where that person was before. And when they go, you don't know where they're going. Before you knew them, they didn't mean anything to you. They come into your life, they have a lot of meaning, and then they go. And this is the way it is in the world. Now, this thought can be useful in a lot of ways. If you find yourself getting up, upset about the other person and really getting into huge battles with the other person, remind yourself you're, we're all going to die at some point and all these issues are going to become meaningless. But what you will have left over is the karma of the way you conducted yourself. So you want to make sure that you conduct yourself in an honorable way. This is particularly helpful when things get really bad. Society breaks down. War happens all kinds of unfair and unkind, cruel things can happen in the human realm. And you want to make sure that you've developed qualities of mind so you can trust yourself in those situations, that you will do the honorable thing and not just kind of scramble to get a little bite to eat and be willing to kill and steal and cheat just for bare survival. Bare survival is not worth it, because no matter what, I mean, the body's going to die at some point anyhow. That's what this 
way of thinking does, is it helps you think about what really is yours, at least in a provisional sense, what you do have in your power. Because even though the, the five aggregates ultimately do not obey you all the time, but there are times when they do obey you. You want your body to move in a certain way, and it moves in a certain way. You breathe in a certain way to give rise to comfortable feelings. You can choose which way you're going to perceive things. Perceive things as self, perceive them as not self. You can formulate thoughts. You can focus on being aware of all kinds of things that you want, up to a point. So while you have that power, you want to use it well. So there's a very strong teaching here on skillful selfing. It's an important teaching on not skillful selfing as well. An important teaching on skillful not selfing would be realize, okay, this is yours for only for a time being. It's not really yours. What good use can you get out of it while you have it? You have youth, you have health for the time being. I know a lot of disabled people who like to refer to people who are not disabled as the temporarily abled. At some point we're all going to become disabled in one way or another. So when that point comes, how do you want to look back on the time when you were able to use your body, you were able to use your mind? When a relationship ends, you want to be able to look back and say, okay, I used this relationship well. I treated the other person well. I acted in a generous way, acted in a generous way, in a virtuous way, an honorable way. So the teaching on rebirth is useful for developing a strong sense of responsibility strong sense of heedfulness, and also dispassion. Is that thinking about the fact that everybody that you meet has been your parent, or your sibling, or your child. And the relationships that we tend to hold on to really strongly begin to seem to be less and less meaningful. When the Buddha says that the the mountain of bones. Suppose all the bones you'd ever had in your bodies, all the various bodies you had. If the bones didn't deteriorate, if there's someone to keep them, it would be taller than the highest mountain. When you think about that, your attachment to your body gets a lot, a lot weaker. As the Buddha says, you think about all the, the tears you've shed, greater than the oceans, or even the blood that's been shed when you've had your throat slit. For what? For being an animal of different kinds that they wanted to kill? For being a thief that they, they catch and they punish? That kind of thought makes you want to get out of the whole process altogether. So the teaching on Rebirth really is a useful teaching in learning how to get good practice and not selfing. Looking at the things that you tend to identify with and really realizing you can't identify. You can't really hold on to them as, you're, as being you or belonging to you. You have them for the time being, as John Lee says. It's, they're things you borrowed, and you have to send them back. Then in borrowing them, you've You've had to feed an awful lot. This is another thought that's really conducive to a sense of dismay. All the food you've had to eat and all the creatures who've had to suffer because of your eating, even if you're eating vegetarian or vegan food, or all the farmers who've had to suffer. This process just keeps going on and on and on. Just that thought should be enough to make you want to gain release. That's a very strong teaching in not-self. So the teaching on not-self is not saved only for the very end of the practice. 
just like they used to have that line of household goods, Mar what is it, Martha Stewart every day. You don't have to be wealthy in order to have good things to use. In the same way you don't have to be at the very end of your meditation practice to get good use out of this perception of not-self. Use it in the context of the Buddhist teaching on, on karma and rebirth. That you approach the teaching of not-self not out of neurotic hatred of yourself, but on the one hand a sense of power that you really could, if you wanted to, shape things in a very good direction. And you can shape it in a good direction, so you want to use the things that come your way for that purpose. But also developing that sense of sangwega, dispassion, that inclines the mind to want to go beyond. So when you take these teachings and use them well, you see that they really are very helpful. They shouldn't just be tossed aside as cultural artifacts. After all, when the Buddha taught rebirth, it wasn't just picking up a belief that was already universally believed in his society. It was a controversial issue. Some people were teaching there was no such thing, other people were teaching there was. And even when the Buddha did side with those who said there was rebirth, he interpreted it in a different way. They had the idea that there was this permanent soul that would go from one life to the next. He said, that's not the case. It's a process. Look at it as a process. And it's pretty precarious. Just because you're a human being in this life doesn't mean you're going to be a human being in the next one. Just because you're comfortable in this life doesn't mean you'll be comfortable in the next. It's a strong lesson in what's inconstant, stressful, not self. You apply it to the narratives that you bring to the meditation. And if you apply it skillfully, you find that you can cut through a lot of the issues that are eating away at the mind. So that your narratives, instead of getting in the way of the meditation, lead you to want to meditate more. Clear up a lot of the issues that you've been carrying around. Incline the mind so it's ready for stillness. So these teachings are not just cultural baggage. They're an important part of training the mind. And if you put them to use, you find that the Buddha was wise in making them part of the training. 